Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What a wonderful time again to, to be gathered again to talk about AI. I had a feeling that maybe I should actually get a, a robot that can come and do the talk here. <laughs> because I, I, get, I bet um, some of you, you can't even tell if I'm, a real, if I'm a real human or is the robot standing in front of you. But let's see as it goes and see if I'm a real person or I'm a robot. But uh, we'll, we'll be looking at infusing AI to put um, the community to the forefront of digital transformation. So again, the big task is how do we, how we look at digital transformation and how do we then move forward from a digital transformation perspective. Um, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit, um, I'll cover things about the AI world. I'll look at um, the evolution of the AI world. And in a nutshell, just so quick, because I've got only 15 minutes, I need to cover so much things in 15 minutes. We'll look at some of the use cases that we need, that we can apply in terms of digital transformation. And we'll look at the challenges, because all of these nice things, they come with massive challenges. So we'll look at those challenges, how we can actually then overcome those challenges. And then I'll do the conclusion. Um, now, to start with, I, I want to start by reading um, this statement. Now, you'll see in the bottom, it says it was done in 1955. And why it's so important that if you speak of AI today, people think it's something that is so new. But actually, it's as old as in 1955, there was a, a, a conference in, in Dartmouth. Now, the, the purpose of the conference was, we propose that a two-month, 10-man study of artificial intelligence be carried out during the summer of 1956 at Dartmouth College in Hanover. Um, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning, so every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. That means you wanna shift what human can do into the machine so that the machine can do exactly what we as human beings can do. Um, an attempt to be made to find how to make machines to use language, form abstractions, and concept to solve kinds of problems now that are reserved for humans and improve themselves. Now that becomes an iteration, ongoing continuous learning of the machine so that they can become better and better, and eventually, there's a chance that they'll be better than human. I think let's wait for that moment, because then you will tell at the end, if I am a robot or my person speaking here. <laughs> now, we think that uh, a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. So that was a founding conference, and that was in 1955, 67 years ago. Now, if you think AI is something that is new, maybe it came into your fourth now, but 67 years ago, that was the founding statement. Now, we're going to be fast forwarding now, looking at um, quickly a brief, the AI world. You've seen that it's as old as 67 years. Now, I bet you those who are sitting here, I don't think there's a 67 years old here unless, just checking. So that means AI was born before our time. Do you agree with that? Now, what does it refer to? It's basically, we, we, want, to, um, the, we want to take, um, it, it, AI refers to the ability of machines to perform tasks that will require human intelligence. Now, what does that tell you? We as humans, we've got massive intelligence. Machines cannot have that ability, but we wanna take the intelligence that we have and infuse that into the machine so that the machine can do it. The reason we want to do it in machine because machine can do it better than us in terms of the speed and the ability of the machine to do that. And, and, and the concept of AI seems futuristic and complex. As I said, 67 years ago, that's what they see. But again, in 2023, if you speak of this, people still think it's futuristic, but it's actually, it's year, today, it's now. Now, if you think about, um, things like your virtual assistants, like Siri. Now, you never know, you never realize that all of these things are part of AI. So if you think about 
what um, Alexa, your self-driving cars that has been announced and they have been around now, your personal recommendation on social media. A lot of these things, it's AI, but how do we take that things that are available and start infusing them in our daily lives in making the business decisions so that we can start moving forward? Now, I'm not going to dwell on this study, but I want to show you, the, if you look at the, nine, at the 67 years, there's three elements of artificial intelligence. The first one, obviously, the artificial intelligence, I want to look here. It was born in 1956, which is the bottom part. But then what came after that is the machine learning. The reason it was difficult to implement um, AI because it's very complex. If you look at the complexity, it's very complex. But when you come to the machine learning, it's less complex than AI. But then if you go to the deep learning, which is the next generation, you start with AI, then you go into your machine learning, and then you go into your deep learning. Where we are now in the year 2000, and that's where the deep learning comes into being, where we can start applying this thing when it becomes much more easier for us to implement. But don't forget the first slide. It's still very complex. And that is why when you look into some of the challenges, why we're starting to implement it is because it is very complex. Um, so in a nutshell, I've already spoke about this. I just want to, 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 to draw your attention in terms of our day-to-day -day basis, where we can actually use, I'm looking at a wide range of applications in various fields. And, and, and those talks about, let's look about the healthcare industry. Now, if you think about the healthcare industry, today, if, if you look about a few years ago, call it what, um, when, when we're hit by the world pandemic, COVID. Now, there was enough data if you think about it, across the world, the health-specific data that we could have taken and start applying intelligence into the data to predict what's going to happen. But we had to go through a process of two years of suffering because at the time, I know of big insurance companies, the healthcare companies, that had massive research that was done before COVID. They actually have a clear view because they collected enough data, but they were scared to apply intelligence into the data to release it so that they can help the nation to move forward. And that is the challenge that we have. We've got so much data, but we don't know what to do with that data. As we walk around, we're collecting so much data. Some of the, of, in the industry space, some of us are wearing the smartwatch. How much data do you collect on a daily basis when you walk around? At the end of the day, the, the amount of data that sits in your smartwatch, it's so massive. But the, the, the intention is, how do you take that data and apply intelligence into it so that we can make business decisions that, that can help us to move forward from the digital um, transformation perspective? Um, finance, that's a big, big, big thing that we can apply into. Um, if you think about, um, I was recently looking at our monetary um, committee that always meet to, to make decisions in terms of the interest rate going up and down. Now, every time I listen to towards the build up of to that one, the reality is none of the, none of the analysts or, or, or the investors will tell you exactly what will be the decision of the monetary committee. Every, the two or three of them that say, no, it's going to go up. Some will say it's going to remain. Some will say it's going to go down. Why can't we take the data that we've collected over the years and start predicting to say, based on the situation, based on where we are now, we can actually tell that tomorrow's decision will be 50 basis up or 50 basis down. Because the data is available. The thing is, how do you apply the intelligence in the finance space to actually start predicting those things? Transportation, you spoke about the self-driving cars. We've got challenge with transportation in, in our nation where our highways are so full. I think most of us were so excited during COVID that the highway was, was, was so open, you can drive anytime you want. But coming back after COVID, we're back to the, to the highway that are so full. How do we take the data and start predicting when should I leave home? What time should I be on the road? All of these things because it's gonna help us to start managing the transportation industry so that we know um, what, what you need to do around that. Um, some of the examples I spoke about, the robots that can assist doctors from messenger assistance, uh, algorithm that will assist us in the, in, the, in, the, in the financial trading. Now, this is a massive one. Now, all of us want to go to the professionals so that help me to understand how the market's going to look like. But actually, the availability of the data, we should be able to tell that I need to invest in this business because it's making sense. I need to do this because it's making sense. Because the data is already available. Tons and tons of data we can actually use to do um, 
these predictions. Um, in, our, in our daily life, what are the use cases where we can infuse um, AI to actually make sound decision? This is a big one. Accounting, I always look in our organization. Always when you go to the finance accounting division, they are always massively over, overpopulated because there's a person that is capturing, there's a person that is checking, there's a person that is approving. All of these people sit here in that queue. But if you think about today, we can actually apply artificial intelligence to start helping us for the, that we can understand the accuracy and efficiency of doing these particular things to reduce the accounting errors. Every time they'll tell you that there was an accounting error, we need to reverse or we need to apply some journals. But the reality is, if you apply the machine, the intelligence, we should be able to, detect, to, to predict those things and start making sense of moving forward. I spoke about the healthcare industry. That's to me, that's still the biggest industry that we can apply artificial intelligence to help doctors to make prediction. To, to, if, you look at, if you look at the amount of data, we know exactly, if, I, I think Google at one stage, they did took a lot of data and they, they can predict that in 15 days, there's gonna be a flu breakdown, there's a, a breakout. But why? Because they had enough data to actually look at the location and the data, then they can start making those predictions. But again, people are scared to listen to those predictions. The reality is that thing's available, it's been with us, but we need to start taking it to the next level and say, how do we use it? Social media is a big one. The generation that are born today are born inside the social media. That's massive in our marketing space, in our, um, how we do our branding, how we, the, the, the brands and all of these things, we can start applying um, AI to actually predict what, what, what's gonna happen. The marketing, I spoke about it. That's a big thing where we spend a lot of our money in our organization, in the marketing. How do we take AI to start predicting, to start doing your, 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 your customer experience, optimizing the marketing campaigns to do the machine language algorithm so that you know exactly when you do marketing, which segment you want to be targeting, how you could, going to send these, these emails, communication to these people, because you know you understand the market in the segment that you can work on that one. Our HR recruitment is one of the biggest things that troubles all of us. We wanted to go through that whole process of doing interviews, analysis of doing the, the entire, every time you want to replace a person, it's a whole lot of process. Why? Because there's a lot of manual work that goes inside there. And, and we need to start using to, to help us. Sales is a big one. The biggest budget that we're using sales. How do we then apply artificial intelligence in our sales environment so that we can start reducing the budget? Now, there was a study that was done by the Harvest Business Review in terms of um, the sales environment itself. What they said is, um, if we are using AI in the search environment, we can actually increase our leads by 50% or more than 50%. We can reduce our, our call time by over 60% and we can reduce the cost by 40%. And that's the biggest cost of our organization sits in the search environment. How do we apply intelligence, artificial intelligence to make sure that we can move forward in terms of um, those things? So those are the use cases I think um, in 15 minutes that we can start looking into to infuse and to start applying these things in terms of making um, decisions around the technology. So all of these things come with challenges. I said it's always nice when you, what you can do, but what are the challenges that lies ahead? Uh, quickly, if you look at the, there's the biggest one is around the, the regulations, the ethical, the legality around this thing. Every time you start doing, collecting the data, because the data is already in there, what are the, what are the, uh, what are the ethical challenges around it? Can the robot eventually take over from us? Can artificial intelligence take over and do the things that we never thought it will do and maybe never listen to us again? Have you ever thought that we'll, we'll, we'll train this, this machine and it start doing the things that we're doing and eventually takes over from us and it takes the world to a different direction? Have you ever thought about that? Because those are the things that we need to start thinking about when we wanna implement um, this. Data privacy is a big thing. In terms of the decision that it makes, it can make a biased decision. That's the problem with the, with the machine language because it cannot explain how it made the decision. But all it's gonna tell you, this is the decision based on the data that was fed to me, and this is the decision. But if you ask it, how did you come to that decision? It can't tell you, and sometimes it can make a biased decision um, when it comes to that. Uh, what's a big challenge in our country? Something to do with jobs. Every time you try to automate to do something, people think um, people are gonna lose their jobs. In my previous life, we work on, a, it's not even a deep automation, it's not even a deep machine language or, 
or AI. We just applied uh, RPA. We converted what they were doing manually into the RPA. And in that process, we did the work. We led them to do the work, and we, 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 we left them for a year. When you come back and said, how far have you gone in terms of implementing these processes and try to make it work? They said, no, we couldn't move forward because every time we suggest a process that needs to be automated, they are scared that the people who are doing that process will lose their job. So eventually, you can see that we are so scared that because of the job scarcity in our country, we don't want to move deep into the AI to allow the machine to do the work that human cannot do. And always, I always said in, in organizations, when people worry about jobs, just remind them that there are things that AI cannot do. I, I was speaking to my 12-year son, he's asking me what, what AI cannot do. I said, AI cannot tie your shoes, your shoelaces. Think about that. You're still gonna need people who's gonna come and tie shoelaces. AI cannot, cannot do your garden work. You're gonna need a person that do the garden work. AI cannot be a psychologist. Remember the massive work around psychology because it doesn't have emotions. You need psychologists to come in and do the, the real work of emotions. AI cannot do that. There's, while one door is, is closing, the massive door is opening, we can start directing the people not to worry about moving into that direction because the things that machine can do, let's allow machine to do those things and not worry about um, scarcity of jobs. I know I'm running out of time. I'm gonna quickly wrap up now. The biggest challenge is expertise, the skills. We do not have enough. Remember I showed you in 1967 years ago, the complexity of AI to implement is still the biggest challenge. That's the challenge that we have. We, we need as a nation, as an IT community, to make sure that we start dealing with the skill shortage. We will not every time when we need a skill go to India, go to the other countries. We need to start developing. We've got enough resources in this country that we can start developing in terms of the AI. That means we need to invest our money in developing the skill set around AI instead of focusing on, 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 on the other things. So there's always a solution to the, to the skill. Integration, the biggest thing is you can't just bring AI on the side. You need to integrate to your ecosystem. How do you make sure that whatever you bring on board will still integrate into your ERP, into your existing system? Because that's the power, because you don't want to run standalone or disintegrated systems. You want to make sure that all your systems are integrated. And the biggest thing, as I said, is cost. Now, cost and complexity goes together. The reason is, Organizations are scared to, 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 in, to invest money into this. Think about during COVID, around that period, how much money we as organizations have invested in the, in, the, in the concept of remote working, moving everyone to work on teams, making sure that customers can, we can save customers away from the office. The massive budget, I saw my budget tripled, and I cannot justify those things. Even today, when I have to go and explain why the budget tripled, the IT budget, I can't explain because it was the, the process COVID pushed us to do that. We have to find other reasons that would push us to actually start investing um, more money in terms of this. Yes, it's gonna cost us more money, but it's the right thing to do so that we can eventually reap the benefit at, at a later stage. I'm gonna conclude, um, I'm gonna talk about, um, so there's all these three elements of the, of the AI, and, and this one I'm just gonna show you, basically where AI sits, sits in the space, but for AI to work, you need the data. So there's always that relation that you need a lot of big data that will teach your, your, your artificial intelligence. Once you start teaching the machine, then it can improve your internet of things. Now think about, I collect massive data every time I walk here. That data that I collect on, my, on the internet of things, whether it's in the mining industry, whether it's in the health industry, that data needs to be fed into the big data. Once it's fed into the big data, then we push it to teach the machine, what it must do. And continuously we improve the performance of the machines. That's what we need to keep on doing, the data. So these are called the, the virtuous triangle of, of AI. And in conclusion, I'm, I'm, in conclusion I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I wanna mention that um, AI is rapidly evolving. It's a, it's a rapidly evolving technology that um, the potential to revolutionize the way we live and work. So it's here, it's gonna be here. The way we live, the way we work, the way we do things is gonna happen. Uh, that's from your healthcare, your transportation. We have made a lot of improvement and significant improvement, but we need to tap more into those things. As with any new technology, as I've mentioned, it's a new technology when you speak of it today, but it's 67 years old. But we, as with any new technology, there are also challenges and ethical concern that we need to address. 
And that's why when I was looking at the challenges, I kind of talk about how we deal and address those challenges. Because they will be there, but we need to find the ways to deal with them and address those challenges. So it's important for us to approach AI with caution and responsibility. We need to be responsible. Remember, I always dream about this, that one day the machine will take over. But I'm scared that will they take over and then human cannot control it. Think about where we are now from the, um, the climate control, the climate change. It's human that caused that thing to happen. And today we're struggling to manage and control it. Don't you think one day we will reach the same stage when you start getting the machine to do more and more of the work that we, we human are not gonna be able to do? Remember, there's still a lot of use cases that the machine cannot do. We still need people to perform and do those work. Um, you will see that I, in my presentation, I did not even mention, not even once, chat GPT. Why? Because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a popular topic. Everyone's talking about it. But it's here. We need to look at the biggest challenge there. It's around the, the regulation, the legalities. How do you use it? The academics are struggling with that. They will, they will confirm that we've got it now. You can ask it, please write me an essay. Please do this for me. But is it legal? Where does plagiarism come into being? There's a lot of rules, governance around it that we need to put into place to make it work for this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I wanted to give you for today. Thank you very much.